Assalamu alaikum all. On the month of victory of Bangladesh, I welcome you all to our today's discussion. Uh, for decades, we have been told that since Pakistan was created in the name of Islam, its, um, its breakup in 1971 must also demonstrate Islam's failure. Uh, this assumption has never been critically analyzed either in Pakistan or in Bangladesh, nor in anywhere else for that matter. This issue of war of liberation is much more sensitive in Bangladesh and attempts have been made to instrumentalize this monumental event in the Bangladeshi people's national history to de-Islamize Bangladesh. The westernized elites in Bangladesh constantly tell us that Islam is to blame for the horrors in horrors of the 1970 war and the painful events. <laughs> For example, the language movement in 1952 uh, is one of them. The situation is no different in Pakistan either. The elites in Pakistan, like their Bangladeshi counterparts, believe that Islam is the culprit. However, it is difficult to uh, it is difficult uh, to reconcile such a narrative with the fact that with the fact that Bhutto's avowedly un-Islamic, if not anti-Islamic, Idhar Hamudhar Tom proclamation uh, is the one that eventually resulted in the independence of Bangladesh. Today, Professor Salman Said uh, joins us to demystify this paradox and set the record straight about Pakistan and the birth of Bangladesh. Professor Salman Said is Professor of Social Theory and Decolonial Thought at the University of Leeds. From 2010 to 2013, he was the inaugural director of the International Center for Muslim and Non-Muslim Understanding in Australia. His main intellectual interests are in the areas of critical Muslim studies and political and cultural theory. He is the author of books like A Fundamental Fear and Recalling the Caliphate that are of heavy importance to the Muslim world and beyond. He is the founding editor of the Reorient Journal published by Pluto Press and a frequent contributor to international and national media. Uh, today, at first, Professor Said will make his opening statement. After that, we will have a discussion session followed by a Q&A session. In the Q&A session, viewers will have the opportunity to ask questions uh, via the chat box. Um, please make sure your questions are brief and relevant. Now I would like to welcome Professor Said and invite him to deliver opening remarks. Okay. Thank you very much for this invitation and it's a great pleasure mm. to speak once again on this topic and hopefully technology will not let us down this time. Okay, um, let me start off with um, following up with what Fahima has actually said. From 1947 to 1971, United Pakistan was the largest Muslim country since the time of the Mughals. So the fact that it broke up in 1971 is, is a momentous occasion, but it is one that's really, really discussed as a problem. No one, um, there is very little argument about why it happened. There is a sense in which both academic and public discourse thinks that the breakup was inevitable it was bound to happen. Therefore, it was expected. Therefore, it's not a problem to explain. The reason why it's considered to be inevitable is normally put down to because of geography. Uh, Karachi and uh, Dhaka were 2, over 2,000 kilometers away from each other by plane. It could take a ship five, uh, five to seven days to go from Karachi to Chittagong. Um, so there was the idea of geography made it inevitable. However, we know that there are many, many countries or many examples of countries which have been separated by even greater distances. So for example, Hawaii is a part of the United States, but it is thousands of kilometers away from the mainland of the United States. Similarly, Alaska is thousands of miles away for kilometers away from um, the United States. And there are other examples about France and the Netherlands, etc., Denmark, all of these countries. So geography itself, it doesn't seem to me is a very useful explanation of this. 
The second argument is because of ethnicity. And the argument is that because um, Pakistan was a multi-ethnic state, um, therefore it was inevitable it would break up into two. Um, again, there are so many multi-ethnic states, multilingual states, for example, like India or Switzerland or um, Russia, it is not considered inevitable that just because you have multi-ethnic states, they will break up. So that doesn't seem like a strong argument. The third one is because of personality. It is argued that the ambition of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, the stupidity of Yahya Khan, was the main reason why Mujibur Rahman, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who should have been the rightful prime minister of a united Pakistan, was not allowed to become prime minister of Pakistan. But the thing is, personalities themselves don't explain everything because often these personalities don't work in a vacuum. They work in a context. They are part of a larger social network and associations and structures which give them relevance. But now all of these answers, geography, ethnicity, personality, depend on a fundamental underlying assumption. And that is that the creation of United Pakistan was improbable. Pakistan was an improbable creation that was impossible to maintain. In other words, the breakup of United Pakistan is not written in the actions of individuals or actions in social actors. It's almost written in the stars. Ultimately was a failure because it was ultimately a failure of Islam. And the failure of Islam in the modern world to be a glue, to be a force for solidarity was that was strong enough to keep this largest Muslim country together. So the argument is this, that if Islam was not strong enough to keep this largest Muslim country together, this most a country built on that hope, then Islam itself has no purpose in the world of politics, the world of culture. Islam is basically something that should be relegated to the private sphere. Islam is what you do when you pray, that's it. It has nothing else to do with your life. Now, if we understand that the failure of a united Pakistan was a failure of the very idea of Pakistan, because the very idea of Pakistan was to build a new Medina, to create a Medina state. This was the utopian hope of uh, many of the people advocating Pakistan. They weren't trying to create just another country. They were trying to create something different, something that had not been created before. They were trying to create a Medina state. It was a utopian wish, but it is important because if you say that the failure of Pakistan really is a failure to build the possibility of building Medina, then you are saying that Islam itself is simply a collection of habits and practices and prayers. It has no social significance. It has no significance in society. It cannot be about making society better. So I think it's important to understand what is at stake in this debate uh, or non-debate and why this is important. Now in this talk, I'd like to make a number of points, but the main one that I want to argue is that the failure of a united Pakistan was not a failure of Islam, that the failure of Pakistan was rather a recognition that Islam was not taken seriously. And because it was not taken seriously, it never was understood what the purpose of Islam was in the formation of Pakistan, a united Pakistan. 
Pakistan was based on the principle of Muslim a homeland, but it was also understood that it had a larger project, a larger responsibility, that it underwrites the possibility of a better future, not only for uh, Muslims of South Asia, because the idea was, of course, having a strong Pakistan, a united Pakistan, would mean two things. It would mean those who were in Pakistan would benefit, but those who were outside Pakistan would also benefit because Pakistan would be able to exert a moral influence and protect their rights as well. Fundamentally, Pakistan was a guarantee of Indian heterogeneity, that India itself would not become a, a, a narrow particularistic uh, state. It would not become xenophobic. It would be kept open because of Pakistan. And in that way, Pakistan also had significance beyond um, South Asia because ultimately Pakistan would underwrite the idea of Islam in the modern world, which was a guarantee that the world will continue to be pluriversal. It will be a plural world rather than a world based on one or two um, major blocks. Okay, so that's the general gist of what I want to say. Um, but I'm gonna try and, 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 and explain how I'm gonna get there in the time that I have got allocated to me. The first thing I want to do, well, is really to start off with making a general point. To understand what happens in South Asia, we have to understand that there is a set of deep-seated underlying assumptions which color all the production of knowledge, not just of South Asia, but of this set of underlying assumptions is called Orientalism. And some of you may know it's associated with the work of Edward Said. There is a specific branch of it um, called Indonology, uh, by Ronald Inden mentioned it, which is the underlying assumptions about what South Asia is and how it can be under, how it can be studied and how that study can make us aware of some of the major um, structures, the major positions which are possible within South Asia. This is really, really, really important that these underlying assumptions basically frame our production of understanding. And these underlying assumptions take the form that Europe or the history of Europe is the model for the history of everywhere else on the world, everywhere else on this planet. And what you try and do is match up the history of Europe to developments outside Europe and say, ah, this is like Europe or this is not like Europe. And if it's not like Europe, it's considered to be illegitimate. And if it's like Europe, it's considered to be legitimate. So any kind of framing of a big question, like why did the large country since the Mughals break up in less than uh, 20, 30, 25 years, must confront this framework. Now, I don't have time to develop, go into the framework too, in a too detailed way, but I'll just sketch out two points of this framework. One, Indonology posits that South Asia is a entity that exists almost beyond history. 
In other words, the boundaries of South Asia are more or less fixed and have always been fixed. Secondly, that South Asia is predominantly the space where Hindus live, where Sanskrit is um, the fundamental language um, and Sanskrit text colors everything else. In which case, the Muslim presence in this space is always going to be problematic. Uh, Muslims are always going to be looked upon as those who came and interrupted the Indian character of, uh, of India. Now, this means that a number of ways that we understand South Asia is already um, configured to give us diff answers which do not reflect or um, what the actuality of circumstances. Okay, so rather than give you the same old account, I'm going to try and give an alternative account of the breakup of, of um, 19, um, 1971 and the liberation of Bangladesh. What I'm going to do is put the history of the development of Pakistan onto that point of the Pakistan project in the context, not so much of developments inside South Asia, but in terms of developments which occurred across the Islamosphere, across the Muslim Ummah. Now, let me begin with a statement about where the history, where does Pakistan fit in? into this larger history. And this, the context of this larger history is really what I would call the post-caliphate. Until 1924, from the time of um, Hazrat Abu Bakr to 1924, you had a caliphate. Sometimes you had more than one Khalifa or one more than one Khalifa, but you always had one more or less. What this meant is for most Muslims, the question of political thought was reduced to how do we get the right Khalifa? Not how we get the right form of government, but how do we make sure that the Khalifa is the right Khalifa, Khalifa? yeah? So it wasn't about looking for a broader picture because most Muslims would accept that the best government is an, uh, is an Islamic government in the shop of the Khalifa. And therefore what we need to do is try and ensure that that institution is kept and is kept uncorrupted. It isn't uh, problematized by all other human errors and things like that. That was our kind of mission. In 1924, Mustafa Kemal abolished, well, he dissolved the caliphate. What he said was that for hundreds of years, the answers that Muslims had, that what is the best way that Muslims should live, and the answer was they should live under Muslim rule as exemplified by the Khalifa, could no longer have be answered in that way because there's no caliphate anymore. So a number of things happen. And what I'm gonna do now is to look a little bit of the um, what I call Kamalism. Um, and then I'm gonna try and fit that in to the formation of Pakistan, okay? So Kamalism wasn't just the uh, policies, it was also a, a kind of an ideology that emerged around the Mustafa Kamal and it, talked about itself in organized by six, the six arrows, the six principles. 
Republicanism, which was a replacement of the caliphate, secularism, the separation of state from religion, very important. Um, the idea of popular sovereignty, the idea that what you were doing, you were breaking with the past. The Turkish Republic was very, very uh, concerned not to be seen as a continuation of the past. And clearly, the most important, the idea of nationalism, that the only legitimate government was a homogenous nation state. Now, in the period from 1922 to about 1935, the Kemalists in, in the Turkish Republic introduced a series of major changes. Um, they abolished the Sultanate. Um, they abolished the, um, the uh, Fez. They got rid of um, the, the, the calendar, Islamic calendar. They introduced a new alphabet. Now, alphabet reform is very important because what it does, it made everyone illiterate prior to that. Imagine if you suddenly had to give up the alphabet and learn a Latin alphabet. It meant that you would not be able to read the diaries or even the gravestones of your uh, grandparents or anyone. You basically rupture. The law of surnames gave everyone a different surname. Almost the bureaucrats would go around giving people names, choosing what the names should be. Now, these reforms were aimed at understanding that as Muslim society, you had to westernize Muslim society. But westernization considered itself to be a rejection of Muslimness, you, modernization in Muslim context meant de-Islamicization in different ways. You can see this most clearly in the case of the Turkish Republic, but these reforms, these measures were not simply contained in the Turkish Republic. Uh, a number of uh, Kemalist leaders appeared, and you can see, I've just named some of them, all of them basically were following the principles of Kemalism. Uh, Reza Pahlavi in Iran, in, in Indonesia, in Afghanistan, in Egypt, all of them took some of those understanding, the fundamental understanding that modernity meant westernization, and westernization meant de-Islamicization in some shape, way, or form. So what does Kemalism mean? Kemalism meant that you tried to go for a pre-Islamic past as a source of legitimacy. It meant that Islam was excluded from the public sphere except as, as a slogan. It meant an emphasis on the idea of a Westphalian state based upon one people, one land, based upon um, the idea of uh, nationality as being the key, key uh, source of identification. And you could see that throughout the world, all the Muslim countries more or less began to follow that principle. Now, the challenge for Pakistan, of course, was different. So, in a way, what I want to say is that this Kemalism became from 1924, it became the way in which Muslim countries, which became um, tried to govern themselves, the way that Muslim countries thought of themselves, all the way from um, Senegal to Indonesia. And these principles drove those policies forward. Now, the Pakistan project was the first interruption of this logic. What at the heart of the Pakistan mobilization, the idea that Muslims constitute a nation. What that means is Muslims constitute ethical subjectivity. 
this is precisely the antithesis of Kamalism because Kamalism said that being a Muslim was not really important. It was ethnic sources, ethnicity, which led to nationalism, which was the main political subject. So people were not Muslims, they were Turks. They were not Muslims, they were Egyptians and so on and so forth. In Pakistan, they could not say, if they said, there is no unified ethnicity in Pakistan. So you had two alternatives. You could have had a British rule, a number of major countries which were ethnically more or less homogenous or linguistically homogenous or culturally homogenous, which would be on there. So you'd have a Republic of Gujarat, a, Re um, a Republic of Punjab. You could have broken this up in that case, these countries would have been much closer to the model of Europe. However, for a variety of reasons which we don't need to go into, there was an attempt to try and create a pan-Indian uh, identity which could mobilize against the very powerful British identity, the British rule. What you have then in this pan-Indian identity is not an ethnic, but a, 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 an attempt to construct a multi-confessional, a multi-ethnic, a multilingual uh, position. However, this to build a pan-Indian identity ran into problems to do with a project of trying to construct the possibility to prevent the successor to the British Raj becoming simply a Hindu state. And that meant that you had to construct a pan-Muslim identity because a pan-Muslim identity was able to stretch all across the region. It was able to do most of the same kind of work and it was big enough and large enough to actually contest that. Now, many of this, uh, this pan-Muslim identity was also built on the history of mobilizations and pan-Islamism, like the caliphate movement. So the two nation theory has to be seen in the development, in the intellectual development from 1924, not from just what happened in South Asia. Because it is impossible to think that Muslim thought was not being influenced by what was happening everywhere. In fact, we know that what happened in, in, in 1924 was a major trauma for many, many groups, many Muslims, um, People in Malaysia, re rebels in Malaysia, took up the caliphate flag. Malaysia had never been under caliphal rule, direct caliphal rule. Um, there's a case in Australia in 1916, a number of Muslims held up a train and raised the caliphate flag. So Australia was never a part of the caliphate. So it is, we have to put this in this broader context. So the Pakistan movement emerges as an interruption of Kamalism by saying that being a Muslim is a political responsibility. It is a critical political responsibility. So that is the mobilization that inspires millions of people to build not something which was already there. There's no reference. There is nothing in the Pakistan movement which says we will be the heirs to the Mughals we will be the heirs to the Delhi Sultanate. No, it is saying we will build something new. And this continues to be reflected in the citizenship laws of Pakistan, despite everything. Uh, their, their laws of citizenship in Pakistan are very, very similar to the laws of citizenship. They don't privilege simply um, blood. Okay. So the Pakistan interruption was mobilization on the basis of Muslimness. It was the formation of a state on the basis of Muslimness. It was an ex nihilo formation, when I mean that it had no predecessor, so it was almost new. Alas, 
the problem was that the government of Pakistan remained on the basis of Kamalist logic. And this was exemplified with the 1950 Citizenship Act, which basically closed the door for Muslims from the rest of South Asia being able to come to Pakistan. It made Pakistan a ordinary country, just like another Westphalian state. So between 1947 to 1951 and early 50s, you have the possibility of this project to build and create a modern Medina state. The Pakistani elite, for reasons we can go into, could not have the imagination or the ability to see that through. And the various legislations that began after 51, for example, the um, insistence on Urdu as the uh, attempt to make Urdu the state language, this attempt to try and make a Pakistan citizen by creating a Pakistani ethnicity began to undermine that logic which had interrupted Kamalism. So as the tragedy of Pakistan then remains, that those who believed in it were never able to rule it. And those who have ruled it for the most part have never believed in it. And that is a fundamental problem at the heart of the Pakistan project. So after 1951, what you have is the um, slow gathering in of attempting to build a Westphalian state. And I would, now the real shock then comes to the Kamalism is with 1971, with the Islamic revolution in Iran, which demonstrates that not only is it possible for Muslims to have a political identity, but that they can overthrow a very powerful state, that Muslims can be part of the conversation of political modernity. Um, the second, the third element of this is the 2002 victory by the AK party in Turkey, which begins a kind of a Islamic friendly um, transformation, again, reasserting the, uh, the emptiness at the Kamalist project. Now, I think we are at the heart of this conflict between Kamalism and those who oppose it is something which is going on throughout the Islamosphere. Um, and it is the fundamental conflict on this. The ironies of the Kamalists are that they say that they want to keep Islam out of politics. They want to secularize. But in nearly every single case, what they have done is not separate state and church or state and mosque, but they have tried to get the state to take over the mosque, the madrasa. Um, they have basically tried to take control over Islam, and it is the inability to take over control over Islam, which is the cause of the failing of these projects. Okay, what I want to um, end with is I'd like you to just reflect on this um, last slide. Uh, Professor, I'm interrupting you a little bit. Uh, so uh, could you please zoom out because um, sometimes the parts of your slides are not visible to us. Okay, I will try and zoom out from that. Let's see, how can I do this? Is that better? Uh, yes. Okay, can you see all the slide now? Uh, Okay, let me read this out, okay? Because I think it's important. I was just... Can you see the slide now or not? Still not? Uh, yes, now it's clear. Okay. 
So basically, it says that no, Muhammad of Arabia ascended the highest heaven and returned. By God, if it was my, I would never have come back. Now, this is, um, some of you may recognize this from um, Iqbal's um, reconstruction of um, religious thought. Uh, I would think any Muslim who reflects upon that must actually think radically about why does the prophet come back? Now, Iqbal goes on to argue that the prophet could have become a mystic. So the idea, how many people listening to this would have come back if it had been them? If you could go to the highest heaven, would we want to return? And the return itself is the difference between what makes the prophet the prophet, because the idea of the return is the idea that Islam is there, not just simply for the individual, but for society. It's to change society. That is the purpose of that. Now, what the reason why I want to conclude with this is that to understand the breakup of uh, Pakistan, one has to abandon the idea that it broke up because of the weakness of Islam. It broke up because of Malikism. Very few of the measures that one would have wanted to see in a Medina state were actually and with sufficient depth. Many of the inheritance of them from colonialism and Kamalism were simply applied. So it wasn't that the two nation theory failed. It was the two nation theory and this attempt to create Medina was never ever applied. And that it seems to me is really the fun issue which explains the failure of a United Pakistan project. Because all the other examples do not really hold up water. If you look at um, the idea that, you know, the uh, Bangladesh could not have survived, well, Bangladesh is thriving. In a few years time, inshallah, I think it'll have the high, um, highest GDP per capita uh, compared to India and Pakistan. Uh, now, again, we know there are many, many issues, but in that way, the idea that it could not do so, the idea that uh, Pakistan would collapse in six months, well, so all of the kind of indological discourse has not been able to shatter. The reason why the United Pakistan project still maintains itself because it maintains those two countries, the traces of that are still there, is because ultimately at the level of popular mobilization, the people understood what was involved in the attempt to create a united Pakistan. It is their tragedy that their elites perhaps did not understand as well. And that I would say to you is the fundamental position, not just in South Asia, but throughout the Muslim lands right now, that there is a disjunction between the rulers and the ruled in most cases and part of that disjunction is to uh, not to understand for ordinary Muslims, all Islam means is a name for um, justice, a hope of something better. So a society without Islam will for Muslims be a society without justice, a society without hope. And that is one of the projects right now to try and remove Islam why prove so difficult despite so many attempts? Even Saddam Hussein had to add Allah Akbar to the flag after he was losing power, uh, when he was losing power. And you have to ask, why did he have to add uh, uh, Allah Akbar to the flag? A man who was a secularist, a man who did um, all sorts of things. So what I would say to you, to understand 1971, we have to put it in a broader context of the post-caliphate history of thought among Muslims and the consequences of that being worked out. That 
gives us, I would argue, a much more profound understanding of what led to these things and what the under, how that understanding can help shape a better future for everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your wonderful uh, delivery and also the presentation. Uh, I think um, um, it was some sort of divine um, a divine ruling that we have this session today because I believe it has been much better. <laughs> and, uh, wow, what are you saying? <laughs> uh, no, there is some sort of divine wisdom to it. Bahin, I'm going to take that as a compliment rather than a criticism. Uh, no, 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 it was not a criticism of your story. But, but... <laughs> I'm joking with you. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. Uh, um, uh, Don't worry. Yeah, I have learned a lot. Um, I have read uh, the blog piece that you uh, that you have written, but I think uh, this is much more detailed and, um, and and there are a lot more ideas here. And I think um, all of us who have joined. Well, uh, this is from the book that um, uh, a lot of this is writing the book that I'm, I'm writing um, uh, on the um, it's from that the promise. So it's really about that kind of promise that means to so trying to do a political theoretical understanding rather than an empirical political uh, understanding of these events. So I think it's really, really important that we break away from Indonology. Otherwise we will not understand um, what's happening around us in South Asia at least. Um, so Professor, uh, now we will have a discussion session um, um, which, uh, uh, in which uh, I would like to uh, invite Rakib Bhai and I also see uh, Hussain Bhai here uh, to participate um, and ask questions, or maybe uh, if need be, I criticize aspects of your talk. Uh, I will start with this uh, following question that I had asked yesterday as well. Uh, so uh, the citizenship issue uh, is a very big issue all over the world right now, and especially in the Indian subcontinent, uh, we are seeing uh, the problem of statelessness, especially with regard to Muslims. So the state of India, it has officially taken over the role of uh, 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 the role of protector of um, most other faiths, uh, except for um, Muslims, except for Islam in South Asia. And they, ha they are offering citizenship to uh, people of all faiths, except uh, Islam. Uh, but on the mm -hmm. other hand, uh, uh, we see in India and also in other parts of South Asia that expressions of Muslimness are criminalized and people who want to live as Muslim, uh, not as a passive subject, but uh, they want to uh, let Islam have the right to shape uh, the public sphere. So they are being told to go back to Pakistan. This is a very ridiculous idea because they had never been to Pakistan. They, ha they uh, do not come from Pakistan in the first place, neither their ancestors. But uh, the, the Pakistan, uh, uh, there is no indication that it is willing to take up the role that India has taken for other faith communities. So what is your take on that? Look, I think um, nothing that I've said in this talk should be seen as any kind of romanticism of the current um, state of Pakistan. What I've talked about is the Pakistan project. And what I've also described is the tragedy of that project. So I will say two things about this. It's really interesting that why in, 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 in South Asia, despite everything, when Muslims are expelled, the idea is they should go home to Pakistan. Like you said, it's a ridiculous idea but think about the logic of that idea. In a way, that's a kind of an admission of that the, the Pakistan has to be a homeland for the Muslims, but a homeland doesn't have to be a territorial state. Now, one of the things in the early part of Pakistan, it was very, very clear among the earlier leadership uh, before, let's say, 51, that a strong Pakistan was a guarantee of the guarantee for Muslim minorities 
in on living under Indian rule. Because the argument was that things became too difficult. Pakistan would be able to exert or in a um, certain pressure, diplomatic, moral, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And to the extent that, for example, in Kashmir, the situation in Kashmir is terrible, but Kashmir is still managed up till recently maintain some kind of semblance. The reason why that issue is alive and it has not gone the way of just Hyderabad, it hasn't just simply been absorbed, has been to do with uh, Pakistan's ability to withstand. And the problem is this, that uh, the Pakistani leadership has never, I don't think has systematically seen its role in that way. And, and, I, and I, so therefore, you're right that, you know, what would Pakistan do if there were hundreds and thousands of uh, people being expelled on their borders? I imagine that the government may make, depending on the government, may, you know, it'll be interesting. I can only say to you one thing. If you look at the 1980s, where the expulsion of the um, hundreds, millions, three million Afghani refugees came to Pakistan. And... Being a refugee is nowhere, it's not fun anywhere, but they were able to come to Pakistan. In the way, same way the Syrians have been able to come to Turkey, maybe 5 million of them. If there had been a different government in Turkey, a nationalist government, a, command, a really hardcore communist government, they would have shut the borders. So I don't know the problem for Pakistani elite, for its Kamalist elite, is that it cannot simply do what other Kamalist regimes do, because the legitimacy of the, its creation is so bound up with that, that it makes it really, really problematic. Now, that doesn't mean it may not happen, but it is far more difficult, because in the end, at the level of sort of, uh, and not just the level of people, but even at the level of institutions, civil service, um, many, many people in the military, all of them have a commitment to this idea in some shape, way or form. Now, no one knows at what point that commitment is abandoned, but the fact that it exists, the fact that it can mobilize things is not completely unimportant. Um, I see uh, some of our participants are willing to raise questions, uh, and um, I would like to invite uh, Simon Bhai to raise the question that he would like to ask. Uh, Simon Talukdar Bhai. Uh, are Okay, so uh, good evening. Uh, I am Simon Reza uh, from Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, I teach law at Brack University. So mm -hmm. thank you so much, uh, Professor Said, uh, for providing a completely new uh, perspective uh, uh, to understand uh, the ideology that is Pakistan. Um, what, like, I believe or what I heard from my grandparents as well, uh, that um, the ideology uh, of uh, Islamic state or, uh, or kind of like um, a state based on Muslim that was influenced uh, by the experience um, or the local context of Bengal. The Islam uh, was used as a tool to fight against the feudal lords uh, in Bengal, uh, the fight against the Jominders. Because when the Hindus um, uh, were fighting for uh, Tevaga, Tevaga means like three part. Uh, so uh, the crop uh, of the land, um, mm -hmm. two portion would be given to the uh, peasants or farmers, and one portion would mm -hmm. go to the Jominders. 
so that was the movement uh, by the um, hindu peasants uh, 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 but uh, because uh, almost all the crops uh, would have been taken by the jomintas or the feudal lords um, uh, so the counter was the tibhaga but it was uh, the muslim uh, local muslim leaders like haji shariyatullah or uh, titumir who actually um, started like wiping out this jamindari or wiping out this feudal lords uh, uh, away from uh, uh, the indian subcontinent and they they were the islamic preachers they were the local islamic leaders um, they are also the uh, fighters on behalf of the mass people who fought for their land rights so this is how the islam was popularized in this bengal and it is not only a religion rather it is also a means to fight against the oppressors so when after having pakistan when the Beng- bengalis again saw the discrimination and uh, a maltreatment and all all, all of their uh, like fantasies regarding pakistans became wrong then they had to have a second thought about that idea so maybe um, i also agree to you um, that was the mistakes by the uh, pakistani elites uh, the mistakes of the kamalism but uh, we the people from bengal see it as a uh, continuations of those jamindars or the feudal lords uh, which actually we vowed to wipe out through the ideology pakistan that did not came through so that was my uh, perspective to share with you thank you so much thank you do you want me to say something on this uh okay so i thought that would be a question but um no that was more of a comment i mean the only yeah, thing i would I... say that uh go on for him what do you want to do Uh, yes, what do you wanted to say? Um, uh, I just wanted to you... say, look, one has to be, I don't disagree with your, your what you said, but you have to be careful about two categories. You talk about religion and you say that there is an instrumental use of religion. Religion is used to do something else. But the concept of religion itself is based upon the experience of Europe. So I'm not sure that that applies in the same way because religion denotes describes one kind of sphere and that comes from european understanding of their understanding of a variety of christianity it doesn't necessarily apply to uh, islam or hinduism or buddhism or judaism or zoroastrianism uh, to give you one very simple example of this when the quran was first translated into english the concept of religion didn't exist in english so wherever they saw the word deen they would translate it as holy law or sacred law so i do think it's very very easy to talk about religion as simply a mask that people wear for real things but i would say to you that ultimately what you're talking about is the creation of identities and in that sense the mask becomes the face so you can't talk about a mask or the instrumental use of things they actually become completely identified with that so the final point that you made that you know they wanted to this uh, um, use islam to fight against the injustices they felt i'm not sure they're just using it i think it's that they're understanding injustice and they're understanding islam as a force for justice and that's not that's not an instrumental thing that's a deep conviction but i don't disagree fundamentally with your description um we have some more questions so uh two of them both of them related to uh, each other from mohammad hosain bhai hosain bhai would you like to read out the questions for professor said uh 
Ah, okay. So uh, uh, I'm reading out to them. The, the first question is, um, uh, he says, and I'm quoting him, a question on the YouTube channel video, which seems pertinent to the discussion today. Uh, do you consider Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who, uh, who based his liberation on secularism, explicitly a Kemalist? And the second one uh, is, additionally, do you consider the separation of Pakistan in 1971 a tragedy or an ideal of self-determination? Or, or okay, an ideal of so, yeah, I think there are two issues here. What was the position of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman in 1947? So, in a sense, what you have to understand here is this, that while we've been talking about Kamalism in this way, um, I'm not sure that all the positions that everyone took up were necessarily about Kamalism in a sense. The question you have to ask yourself is this, that why was it that from, let's say from 56 to 71, around the mid fifties there, there was still an argument to maintain a united Pakistan. Part of the rationale was some kind of level of commitment to the project of a united Pakistan. That I think is important to bear in mind. Now the question about tragedy or national liberation, I don't see those two things being necessarily opposites. Um, if you mean about tragedy, uh, hundreds and thousands of people died, had their lives uh, shattered. That's surely not a good thing. Um, but liberation and tragedy are not are not are not um, not in opposition with each other. Um, now, the question is this: I suppose, would alternative policies and alternative outcomes have been possible? And the, everything that I've said to you should be clear that I don't believe um, that things are inevitable. Um, and the whole point of my argument has been to show the contingency of something. That means to say that things happened for specific reasons, but it wasn't inevitable that they would happen in this way. And I think that's important to bear in mind. Um, there has been another question from uh, Mirza Musharraf Hussain. Um, I would like uh, him to uh, present his question before Professor Said. Okay, thank you uh, so much. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Professor uh, Said and uh, everyone. Uh, my question is uh, the creation of Bangladesh has orphaned the Muslims of the western part of the undivided Bengal, that is now West Bengal in uh, India uh, through the process of uh, minoritization, uh, social exclusion and identity crisis. And that's why uh, Bengali Muslim or of West Bengal is very easily termed as Jamati or Bangladeshi inside or outside the state. Uh, now, uh, how to address this issue from a critical Muslim studies perspective? Well, I think I've been trying to address it in a critical Muslim studies perspective um, so what I've said to you, I think, is the beginnings of a critical Muslim studies perspective. Uh, I think one would have to look at some of the ways in which the normal terms of debate have to be deconstructed. And I don't mean criticized, I mean deconstructed. So take, for example, the notion of self-determination. Does every instant of self-determination mean the same kind of political arrangements? Um, I think the, so these are kind of like, you know, open-ended questions. So I'm not quite clear what the problem would be. And I'm not really sure that I could do a study in a, few, in a minute or two about, you know, the, the, the question that you raised. But um, everything that I've done, I would say to you is, 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 is um, certainly inspired by critical Muslim studies. Well, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, my question is actually the, the alternative version that you mentioned, yeah, deconstructive. Yeah, yeah well, we are trying to uh, yeah, read our history uh, through um, uh, which the Bengal uh, yeah, was uh, radicalized uh, or uh, that got the now what is called now Hindutva or the uh, mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, what uh, what is now called the uh, the radicalist uh, hindu uh, uh, ideology mm -hmm. the, the fathers of these uh, ideologies uh, like uh, yeah we can say uh, uh, the the literary figure uh, bunkim chandra chattopadhyay and uh, and then yeah we, we can say raja ramon roy who, who are and vishachandra vidyasagar yeah, who are uh, do ideally uh, portrayed or framed as the uh, figures for the renaissance or, or the uh, 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 for the uh, betterment of the of bengal but uh, in a way uh, they whatever they have done yeah, they have just uh, excluded the bengal uh, the, the the muslims of bengal into their consciousness mm. Mm. so but this mm. is Sorry, the, this has been a phenomenon. This is one of the reasons when I said to you at the beginning mm. that mm. the formation of a pan-Indian Muslim subject to oppose that was partly because mm. this was something that was ongoing. Um, mm. Look, people think that um, the repression of Muslimness... Sorry, you have been uh, muted. I don't know how, who I and who has done Sorry, Professor, I can't uh, listen to you. You are not audible. Because Fahim muted me for some reason. I'm not quite sure what I did to offend him. <laughs> uh, so sorry, sorry. Uh, there has been some background noise. Sorry, I, was trying to I was trying to cancel that. It's not me that. making any background noise. It's somebody else. Uh, yeah, obviously not you. So I, I was trying to uh, <laughs> mute uh, Mr. Musar of High in state. Sorry, sorry. No, the only thing I wanted to say about this point, and uh, uh, look, the uh, repression of Muslims did not begin with the BJP. It did not begin with Modi. It did not even begin in Gujarat. Um, if you look at the kind of um, experience over the kind of, uh, for a long time, you can see it something which has been ongoing for a long time. And one of the issues that I would always ask you is this, that in a sense, there've been many, many attempts to argue that a, India was, the project of India was something which was secular. The evidence for its secularity is not strong or secular, what India means being secular is what France means being secular because in the world today, secular means anti-Muslim. Now, during the uh, previous centuries, it may have meant something else. But in the context, if someone says secular, what they have is a measure against Muslimness, whether that's Macron or Modi, or the, you know, what's happening to Uyghurs. So in every single case, that's the case. So secularism is simply a means of disciplining Muslims now, nothing else. So I think that's something that we need to understand. Professor Said, we have some uh, questions from uh, our live YouTube, one of them. So this question mm -hmm. has been posed mm -hmm. uh, 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 posed by Monwar Shamsisar Kowatbhai, and he is asking, mm -hmm. uh, is the creation of Bangladesh of the two nation theory? What is your vision on how the Muslims of Bangladesh and uh, Muslims of Bangladesh can develop their relations now post-1971. I'm not really sure if it uh, falls under your area of interest, but I think it is very important uh, for uh, a Bangladeshi audience. Say that question to, Sahin, can you say that again? Because I didn't catch the first part. What was the first part of that question? Uh, okay. Uh, so and this question has been asked by Mr. Kotbhai and he is asked, and what is your suggestion on how the Muslims of Bangladesh can develop their relations in a post-1971 uh, world? I think the Muslims of Bangladesh, like the Muslims of the rest of the Islamosphere, can only um, develop themselves um, and, 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 and help underwrite 
a pluriversal world by understanding what Islam means for them. Um, Muslim societies which do not give space for Muslims to write their own history cannot do, cannot progress. Ultimately, they will be undone. They will remain uh, unaccountable. And in a sense, the accountability of rulers needs the understanding that Islam is a means for justice and nobody wants a society without justice. And I think that's something really, really important. So what that means in specific contexts needs to be worked out. But I know what it does, what it does not mean is that Muslims think that if they de-Islamicize themselves, they will be safe. Um, in Europe, one of the most de-Islamicized communities was Bosnian Muslims in the 1990s. And I hope I don't need to remind you what happened to them. Many of them only discovered that they were Muslims when the Serbians knocked on their doors. So I think we have to understand what is happening in Burma, what is happening in India, Kashmir, in China, in Palestine, and you know, this list is almost endless. And I'm sure I've missed out many places, but not deliberately. And if you think, uh, like Austria or France now, if you think that Muslims can escape themselves, escape without um, being strong in their convictions, then I think you are, you know, I may be wrong, but I think you're mistaken. There is a, a poem, which title of a book, um, Edward Said wrote called After the Last Sky and has a line which goes something like, um, where will the birds fly after the last sky? And it refers to mainly the plight of the Palestinians. What is happening to Muslims in Muslim countries and outside Muslim countries is a Palestinianization. And that Palestinianization is making the world unsafe. It's making Muslims unsafe. And that is what needs to be resisted. And the only way you can resist this or one of the, is to recognize the connectivity of what is happening. So when you talk about the legislation in India, which turns Muslims who have been living for hundreds of years, some cases, into intruders or immigrants. And then you look next door to what has happened in Burma since 1948, to the Rohingya, it's exactly that, making Muslims homeless. And if you do not see the connections with that struggle for justice and the other struggles for justice, and you do not see how those who see, oh, look what they were able to do to the Rohingya, and now what we can do to the Palestinians, now what we can do to the Kashmiri, now what we can do to the Uyghurs. And if you think this will stop, because once you get into Muslim majority states, they won't do that. Then again, I would say to you, you are mistaken. So it is, it is a judgment that you have to make for yourselves. But my argument would be this, that if you believe in a pluriversal world, in a plural world, then you have to imagine that the world must have a place for Muslims. There must be a place for Muslimness in the world to make sure the world itself remains um, plural. And that's an ongoing project and ongoing struggle, I think. Uh, Professor Said, um, I have one question and it is um, uh, related to what we refer to as Indology. So Bangladesh is a Muslim majority country uh, almost 90% Muslim majority country, but 
uh, in our mainstream media and culture, we see that uh, Muslimness is something scandalous, something to be contained, something to be tamed, and something to be ashamed of, not to be proud mm. of. Uh, and even it's a very uh, uh, interesting uh, phenomenon nationalism sometimes as it is presented. Um, if the nationalism uh, stood against the people it was supposed to represent. Uh, and oftentimes uh, we see uh, that names, for example, uh, 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 nomenclature if, if we talk about that, uh, and other uh, cultural expressions uh, uh, that are supposedly Bengali do not have any resonance with the people uh, Bangladesh, overwhelming majority of them. Uh, and they are mostly Sanskrit. Um, the culture is like pre culture, like almost for 800 years, uh, Muslims have ruled and been uh, the majority of this land, but they are still pariah. And the fact that they are Muslim is a negation of their being native uh, of this land. Mm. And what is the situation like in Pakistan? This is my curiosity. Uh, is it the same in Pakistan as well? And how we can undo this uh, problem? I don't know the situation in Pakistan in any detail. I would say to you that throughout the Islamosphere, there are a large proportion of the population, the elite, who were described by an um, Iranian journalist in the 1960s. He talks about the West toxicated, those who are intoxicated by westernization. And you find them in Algeria, you find them in Egypt, you find them in Islamabad, you'll find them in Dhaka, you'll find them everywhere. And they, on the one hand, they present themselves to a world audience as being Democrat, as liberal, as secularist. But they have been supporters of tyranny in nearly every single case. To give you one very recent example, who supported the overthrow of the only democratically elected president in Egyptian recent Egyptian history and installed a dictatorship of El Sisi, which killed 30,000 people? It was the same people many of the same people who consider themselves to be liberal, who thought they were, um, you know, they were enlightened, they were secular. So this is something which is very, very common. Um, the idea of um, trying to find a pre-Islamic pre um, cultural expressions is something which is nearly all, all, all of these reg Kamalist regimes do. And you made the real interesting point there, Raheem. It is that the idea of a nationalism, which is in opposition to the people, is what I would say is what Kamalism is. And that is why it leads to tyranny, not liberation. Uh, if you look at what's happening in, in, in the Arabian Peninsula, you are seeing the development of a nationalism which is willing to forsake anything to maintain itself in power. So what you're describing isn't something specific to Bangladesh. And it is something which is widely um, happening. And I think one of the most important things that um, you know, people who have um, of good convictions can try and do, is do the cultural work that, you know, Muslims need to be, import to be important players in the construction of a counterculture. And that doesn't mean just a culture of prohibition. This is one of the problems. We are caught between the um, mullahs who say no to everything and the liberals who say yes to everything. And in between the, those yes and no's are exactly the same. They leave no space for the expression of autonomy, the expression of agency. The task for the Muslim presence is to build, like I keep saying the Medina state, it's not already there, 
And that requires not just um, legal injunctions, it requires cultural expressions. When you go to, uh, when you think of um, these, you know, the Islamic inheritance, it is an inheritance which is rich in ways of life, the ways of living, the way of comportment. It is a thing that is, you know, it is, it is a thing which includes artistic expressions. And the cultural work is crucial, whether it takes the full, you know, and, and this is where I think people mistake this thing because they want to start using this as a way of stifling. One of the things that I talk about is the use, I prefer to use the word Islamicate. That is inspired by Islam, but not reducible to Islam. And I think the cultivation of the Islamicate, that cultural work is important. I don't know about Bangladesh, but in many, many parts of the world, look at the effects of Urtugal, the TV series. How it is galvanized, even at the small level, even, even if even parents with children want them to learn something about it, what good it does to those children to see a story in which they have, they can identify with the characters, which is meaningful to them. Isn't that better than watching Hollywood stories in which the Muslims are always the bad guys and are getting shot, except the good Muslim who drinks and who's not really a Muslim? When you think of these video games and you take on the role of the um, Green Berets or whatever to shoot who? The, uh, the unnamed Muslim. So I think those kind of cultural productions are really, really important for tying this project. The project is to remake something, is to reconnect the Islamosphere. Colonialism destroyed a rich network. And we have the task of trying to reconnect that. That means doing cultural work. That means doing all kinds of work. It cannot simply be based on say your prayers five times a day and everything will be fine. That, by the way, um, it, don't edit this out. I'm not saying saying your prayers is not good or anything like that. All I'm saying to you is this, to the quote that I knew before, Islam isn't, doesn't stop just at the, when you're saying namaz. It doesn't stop just when you are in the mosque. It is also about building a more just and more hopeful society little by little, day by day. And that's why the prophet returns, I would argue. Um, uh, so Professor, you, were, uh, you have been talking about this counterculture and you also talked about Pakistan being an ideological state. But um, one aspect that has been so far left out of your discussion, I believe is the minority question. So what would be the status of the religious minorities uh, within uh, such an ideological state that the Pakistan movement aspired to be. Now, we understand that the ethnic question would no longer be an issue because ethnicity is not a big deal, but uh, what about uh, the religious minorities, Hindus, for example? But I don't see why that would be a problem. Look, I'll give you a, a quote. Take someone like, um, well, take someone like a, a historian, Richard Bulliard, um, historian of medieval Persia, but also world historian, American historian, great historian. He, among others, makes the point that before the Atlantic revolutions, um, if you were uh, poor or weak and you had to live anywhere in the world, you would prefer to live under Muslim rule because Muslim there, was, there weren't corrupt judges and corrupt lawyers and all sorts of things. There was always that, but at least there was an independent um, system of justice, which more or less worked most of the time. So the question is, what behind, what's behind this question, Mahin, is a very pernicious one that Islam um, is against religious minorities. But let me give you a thought experiment. Let's talk over the long period of time. England became under continuous Christian rule 
about the same time as Iraq came under continuous Muslim rule, more or less, about 100 years one way or the other, right? So after a thousand years of Christian rule or rule by Christian leaders, there were no religious minorities left in England. The ones that came, Jews, Hindus, Muslims, they came in the 19th century through immigration. To this day, even after the kind of the Kamalism of the Ba'ath Party, you can find self-sustaining non-Muslim minorities in Iraq. Azidi, for example. The Sabians. There are many of them. So why is it, and I can multiply this example, if Islam is so terrible for minorities, then how do you explain that after a thousand years of Muslim rule, the minority still more or less existed, and a thousand years of Christian rule, the minorities didn't exist? Look at Spain, and I don't want to frighten you, but you do know that Muslims were in Spain for 800 years. So just because they're Muslims in Bangladesh for 800 years, what happened to them? So when Muslims ruled for 800 years, there were many minorities, Christians, Jews existed. After Muslim rule, what happened to all the minorities? There are no religious minorities le left in Spain. Again, the ones are there are very recent through immigration, etc. So I don't see the equation. You'd have to demonstrate to me why is it that if you look at the kind of long duration, and thousand years I think is long enough, why is it the case that in Muslim ruled areas, you have a better chance of existing as a minority than in Christian um, ruled areas, despite the fact that every time you hear nowadays is how intolerant Islam is. They may, so even if the, it is the case that Muslims are intolerant or Islamic rule is intolerant, they must also be very incompetent. So intolerant incompetence is, or what? How would you explain that? So I don't know if that explains. There's also a question here about the, um, is it possible to create the Muslim Ummah? Um, and how will you evaluate the essence of the Islamic state to fight against the... Look, if you mean by the Islamic State, you mean ISIS. ISIS is not a, ISIS is basically a Kamalist state. The ISIS, leadership of ISIS is basically Ba'athist. Its principles are xenophobic. It is super ultra nationalist. So I don't see ISIS um, as an exemplar of what I'm talking about because it's really, um, it's, it's certainly kind of ultra national xenophobic nationalism. And I'm not sure that's a feature or should be a feature of Islam in a way, or Islamic um, political articulation. The Muslim Ummah exists. Our expectations of it are too high. It needs people to work on it still. So, you know, this is what I'm talking about the cultural production. The idea that it doesn't exist is not something that I believe, but the things that what people expect it to do is that it's somehow, it's, it's this, the Muslim Muslim is not the servant of any Muslim. It's not the servant of any Muslim ruler who as soon as they get into trouble, they say the Muslim Ummah must do this and this for us. What have they done for the Muslim Ummah? So I think one has to understand the work that's required to maintain that associations and remember, the Muslim Ummah exists without any institutions in place, really. But, but there is so a I think it, it is a work in progress. But there is a common rhetoric. In Sorry, Bangladeshi Rakim. Thank you. But there is a common rhetoric in Bangladeshi context that Muslim is not a homogeneous category in Bangladeshi context. So Bangladeshi Muslim actually is not a homogeneous category. There are uh, groupings, diversities, and uh, many people with different aspirations and worldviews. So many argue that the Muslim aspirations or something like this level that is something not welcome within the Bangladeshi context. So how can we encounter or engage with this kind of debate? I think you could engage with this counter very easily. You can point to them a country called India, which is not too far away. 
So if you say that um, Muslims are not heterogen, uh, are not homogenous, is India homogenous? How many languages do they speak in India? Now, what India has is a political structure, or China, or Russia. Uh, all of these countries are huge countries, but they're not homogenous, but they have a political structure. So homogeneity is not the issue here. Why would you want there to be homogeneity? The question, and I would say to you, and again, that not only is there, you know, there's all, all social groups are filled with differences. That's not the problem. If they were not filled with differences, there would be no need for political unification. There'd be no need for working together on something. So I think this is an argument that is made by very ignorant people who think they're very clever to point out to the differences in the Muslim world. There's so many differences. Yes, there even, are. Even maybe There's, Rifa Kemal Aydin's idea that Muslim it is something constructed. The, Ke, Kem, Aydin, sorry, I didn't Kemal. catch that. Uh, Jamal Aydin or Kemal Aydin? I don't know his name. There is a common idea. Jamal Aydin. Jamal ID when he argued that Muslim it is something constructed idea there is no existence. Yes, but all identities look so what I would say to Jamal, and I've said this to Jamal, is that look the two things for example, he gives the example of Tipu Sultan, right? And he says the Tipu Sultan writes to the Caliph in Istanbul, and the Caliph says to him, I can't help you because I need the British to fight off the Russians, right? Yeah. What he misses is why does Sultan even bother to write? The issue isn't that you can't help. Deco, if you go and ask your um, cousin to help you, your house is on fire, and you go to your cousin, say, come and help me. You go to your cousin, he says, I can't come right now because my house is on fire. You don't think that he's not your cousin anymore? Do you? No. The point is that you went to him in the first place. So that's the first point. Secondly, the idea that Islamic or identity is concerned, all identities are constructed. You in Bangladesh know this because before 1971, there was no Bangladesh. That is a constructed identity. It doesn't mean it's not real. You have a flag and you have a cricket team. Yes. That's... You have attachment, you have passion. So this is the real test. Before the Bangladesh cricket team achieved test status, who would you support? Now, these are the sort of, so what I'm trying to say to you is that, oh, there was no Pakistan before 1947. So all identities are always constructed. To say that this is constructed implies that something is not constructed. This is false or it's stupid. Take your pick. Uh, so, Professor, we are reaching towards the end of our session. Do you have some more time in your hands so that we am um, basically me? I, I have cannot... more time. I have. A, I can give you ten more. I, can, I have more time. That's right. Okay. Uh, okay. But only if you have time. I don't want to be a bore. No, 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 no. Uh, Professor, no. We're just many of us just expecting. Yes, please. There are two more questions from Taufik. Can you read it out? Uh, Ishraq? Uh, in the con sorry, in yeah. the context of South Asia, if we think about the Ummah concept and try to relate this to the Muslim communities in the subcontinent, it is obvious to feel embarrassed. A Muslim military was so brutal against such a community among which most of them were Muslim will Pakistan ever confess this and apologize and try something great to fix the harsh feeling obtained in the past. What's the question? Uh, the question was... Do I think the Pakistan should apologize and try to I think if you have done wrong, then I think uh, it is important for countries to apologize for the wrong that they have done. You will never bring back the hurt, but perhaps an acknowledgement is an important way to bring in um, reconciliation. So I have no 
you know, I said at the beginning, I mean, for as far as I'm concerned, is that, you know, the person who should have been prime minister in 1971 was Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. He won the election. He should have been prime minister. That's all. And the fact that, and, and, and everything that happened after that was terrible and it requires correction. And that I would say, you know, that's a general position. Uh, Humans so make Professor, mistakes. Um, Sorry, so Professor, I would, uh, yeah, I, I would like to uh, bring up a provocative question here and um, probably offer some, a little bit of uh, criticism of your uh, talk. So uh, when you talk about Pakistani elite, you, uh, it seems like, yeah, uh, you are putting uh, the blame on the West Pakistani elite only, but uh, um, every now and then, for example, we see a picture, a photo uh, of a group of uh, female, univers uh, female uh, uh, students uh, at the University of Dhaka uh, in the 1960s. They are wearing um, uh, not Western clothes per se, but uh, a cloth uh, that is not uh, prescribed or uh, accepted in Islamic terms and also not worn uh, by the uh, overwhelming majority of the people of Bangladesh. And it is uh, Dhaka, Bangladesh, 1960, and it is Pakistan. Uh, so don't you think that the breakup of Pakistan, when we uh, put the blame on the elite, it should be divided into the elites of two halves? Um, and uh, if you look at uh, the geopolitical issue who's, and who actually aligned with whom, uh, you would uh, see that um, neither of uh, the parties were actually um, in line with the idea of Pakistan, as you said. So, look, I, I don't listen. There are two things I want to say to you about this. Um, when I talk about up to 1971, when I talk about the uh, Pakistani elite, I include the Pakistani elite of a united Pakistan. And I think there is clearly the failure to develop that project, uh, to deepen it, was a general issue there. Um, and I think that's not something which is specific to one group or the other. Having said that, I do believe that, uh, for example, sorry, just to go back to saying about, I mean, I'm less worried about the fashion element to it, because for me, that's a symptom and the same things are happening everywhere at the time. So for me, the real issue isn't something about where, what people were wearing or what they were doing, is what they were thinking, what they were doing, what, they, what, were they, what were they imagining? What were they imagining the world? Um, you know, at that time, what was happening to the Rohingya next door? Uh, it, it, you know, we only think about it, what's happened today or a few years ago. So my problem is this, that what I would say to you is this, there was, there is a West toxicated elite um, with a few exceptions, which has been in power or close to power in most of the post-colonial Muslim countries. And it is brought into Kamalism. And that is true of Senegal as it's true of Indonesia. We have not trained our schools, our students to think decolonially. We haven't decolonized ourselves. And the failure to decolonize is ultimately the failure of all these societies in many ways. So if you think about it, we don't have, why would we get omatic consciousness when we don't think omatically, when we're not taught to think omatically? Um, when we basically internalize narratives, racist and colonial narratives from uh, the British or the French or the Dutch empires. So I think that's where I would say to you, I don't, I don't, for me, the talking about the elite is a shorthand way of making an explanation that, you know, the decision making around that was quite restricted. Um, and I do think, 
I mean, I may be wrong about this, but I do think among popular masses, as people say, there was a general understanding, intuitive understanding of meaning of Pakistan, which those who thought they were better than those people who looked upon those people sneered at for most of the time, not all the time. If it had been all the time, then I don't think Pakistan would have been made. But clearly there have been changes in that. And there are now many, many um, people who you know, just didn't understand what it meant to construct a new, a new, to construct a new society out of colonialism. So the opportunity for Pakistan was to construct something different. Um, and I think whether it's a lack of nerve, lack of imagination, or however you want to say it, it was unable to articulate that version. But you know, this is not just a failure of the Pakistan. So when, for example, in Sayyid Qutb writing about Pakistan and Indonesia as being the great hopes for the Muslims, or Ali Erzabegovic uh, talking about Pakistan as, you know, is full of our So I think it's that we do not, how people would even know that. We don't understand our romantic, we don't have a consciousness. We may have school lessons which will say something like, Indonesia is the most populous Muslim country. That's it. We still use racial categories to determine on the thing. We talk uh, in basically colonial language. Um, so Professor, uh, this will be our last question, I believe. Um, we are, you, you are saying that Muslims everywhere in the world are not represented by the states they're having to live in. And in your book, uh, you have referred to the concept of Mukbarat state uh, to explain the phenomena. Uh, there is, um, uh, and you say that the solution to this is an Islamic great power. Uh, I think uh, there is a great a deal of similarity between what you refer to as Islamic great power and what Huntington refers to as core state. So this is a personal query of mine. Would you uh, uh, um, uh, clarify how uh, these two ideas overlap or are similar, are dissimilar from each other? Uh, I thought you and I were getting along very well. If you come Samuel Huntington, you and I will not be friends very well. So uh, I don't think, <laughs> look, in the book, I explain what I mean by an Islamic great power. It doesn't have to be a, 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 a polity, but it is a recognition that the problems which the Muslim Ummah confronts are problems which require a political solution rather than a spiritual solution. That's the first kind of thing that I want to make. Right? I think the idea uh, of a great power was simply to do with this fact that right now, the ability you know, for, of Muslim uh, voices to speak to exercise their concerns is limited because there are no structures. So look what's happening in France, okay? This is a, a democratic country. It is banning organizations um, which fight against Islamophobia. It's closing down mosques and Muslim schools, etc. It's stopping um, basically uh, the education of Muslim children uh, in Quranic studies, etc. It is doing all of these things and the thing that really rattled it was when Muslim people, not Muslim governments initially, or not all Muslim governments, very few, began to say, we will boycott French goods. So the point that I'm trying to make is that the, 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 there is a need not so much for a state, because the question is how you would get a state in the first place. But certainly, as I say in the book, that you need to have a development of this counter culture, this counter kind of public, this voice that says the Muslim voices need to. And only by doing that can you start thinking about uh, guaranteeing 
not only Muslim uh, justice for Muslims, but plurality for the world. And I think that's the fundamental point. So right now you have a situation where, you know, the, the only organization, the OIC, is completely decrepit. And there may be need for a new organization which takes into account that there is a division in countries between those who are accountable and who want Muslims to be writing their own history and those who are uh, tyrannical or authoritarian who are inherently Islamophobic and only want to suppress an expression. And that is the central dividing line right now. This conflict between Kamalism and its opponents is the central dividing line. And maybe there is need for coordination or convergence, but the coordination and convergence will only happen if these, their nationalist narratives, because nationalism is a barrier to uh, fulfill Inherently, uh, so Professor Said, we have reached uh, al uh, almost at the end of our conversation, and it has been a very pleasant and enjoyable one. Mm, thanks a lot for joining us, despite uh, the problems that we faced yesterday. <laughs> and I would like to mention here at, the, at this point that it was uh, Professor Said who actually proposed to have this session all over again from the very get-go uh, today. And I hope you all have also been benefited from his talk and also the conversation that we had in the follow-up uh, section. Mm, thank you all. Uh, Hope to see you soon uh, again uh, in uh, another session that we will arrange. Uh, please um, keep an eye on our Facebook page for updates.